Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Kristen, a clerk in the Franklin County Public Library, and today I have gathered some fascinating minds in sort of a library roundtable um, with yours truly as the moderator. Um, this is going to be broken into two different programs. The first program, part one, we are going to talk about management of libraries and the different ways that different titles, how the boards work, those kinds of things. And then we're gonna move into funding, how libraries are funded, how they're budgeted, what the budget um, has to cover. Um, the second part of the program uh, will be about programming. I know, hope some of you have uh, taken advantage of your library programs. So we're gonna talk a little about those programs, how they come together and community partnerships. Um, a lot of libraries do have partner, are important to their communities because of these partnerships. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna ask these guys to give me a look into the future of libraries, where they think uh, libraries are going as an institution. Um, and then we're gonna wrap up. So hopefully um, all of you will get some information that you didn't have before. Um, and some information that you were looking for. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and let's get started. I'm gonna have each of these folks introduce themselves and introduce, tell me a little bit about that, tell me and you guys a little bit about their libraries. And we're gonna start down here at the bottom with Miss Claire Brown. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Claire Brown and I'm the Young Adult Services Coordinator at Red Deer Public Library, which is in Alberta, Canada. And we are located sort of in between the two major cities in the province. Um, and we're the third most populous, which is 100,000 people. So like, we're not like huge and we're the third most populous city um, in the province. We sort of have a rivalry with a uh, Southern city because we keep like going back and forth, but currently we are third. Um, so our city's population of about 100,000 people. We have three permanent branches um, in the city. And our city is not that big. So anywhere takes about 25 minutes, depending on, you know, red lights. Um, and then currently we also have a pop-up library at one of our local malls. Um, so it's just like a temporary one until the fall. And yeah, that's pretty much me and where I am. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. I wanna move on to uh, probably a somewhat familiar face, at least in the globe. Uh, community, Ms. Susan Bayer. Hello, everybody. I'm Susan Bayer. I'm the executive Byer, director of the Allen County Public Library. That's fine, Kristen. I answer to both. And <laughs> I have been the director here for a little over a year. We are in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So the population of Allen County is about 370,000 people. The city of Fort Wayne is about a quarter of a million people. So our library services that entire population. We have a main library where I am right now in downtown Fort Wayne, and we have 13 branches, and we have a building we call the data center, which is where our IT is headquartered, our collection development, and technical services, and some other specialty services. That, I was surprised about the population. I knew you were in a larger area, but um, it is that. the second largest city in Indiana, and we are the second largest library system in Indiana. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, another familiar face, if you've watched any of my videos, and I hope you have. Miss Tammy. So I'm Tammy Blackwell, and I am the director of the Marshall County Public Library. We serve a population of 31,000. <laughs> So we're, we're a little bit smaller. Um, we actually have three branches. Um, so I'm at our main branch in Benton. And then we have smaller branches in Calvert City and Hardin. And we also have um, an outreach vehicle, a bookmobile service. All right. And finally, the home team, Justin. Uh, I am Justin Brasher. I am the director of the McCracken County Public Library. Um, before me, Susan was here, and my compliments to her. She has a she fostered a great team. Uh, in McCracken County, we have a population of about 60 to 65,000 located in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, where we have a city population of about 25,000. 
and we have one branch and we have the most super cool bookmobile to have ever existed. The first time I saw it, I thought it was a taco truck, actually. <laughs> it's pretty cool. cool. Taco truck. But yeah, I enjoy it. <laughs> um, now, I know McCracken, we're about 30 minutes from Marshall. We have reciprocal agreements, I do believe. Um, Susan, Claire, do your libraries have reciprocal agreements with nearby libraries as far as who can get cards there and that kind of thing? We do not, and that is an Indiana thing. Um, so the state doesn't offer reciprocity like Kentucky does with its counties. That was okay. a bit of a for me, quite honestly. Claire, what about you? Uh, we do. So in Alberta, we have something called Me Libraries. So you can get a library card at your home, quote unquote, home library, which is be where you pay your taxes, whatever county or city that you pay your taxes in. And then you can register online to borrow for free with other libraries. Okay. Okay. And then we also have interlibrary loan service, which I imagine you guys all have too. Yes, we do, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So let's get, let's jump into some nitty gritty. Now, um, I want to ask how are li your libraries managed? Each of you, like who do you report to? Who does that, is there someone above you, below you? How does all of that work? Um, Cause we've heard a lot about, uh, I hear a lot about some places have library boards, some may not. Um, and I'm just interested in how that works, especially in the different locations. Um, Susan, let's start with you. Sure. Well, I always say that at the top of our organization chart is the patron, the patrons of Allen County, the taxpayers of Allen County. But as far as who I report to, I report to a seven member board of trustees. That's another fun little difference between Indiana and Kentucky, because in Kentucky, the library boards are typically five members. I'm looking at my colleagues and they're nodding. Yes. Um, in Indiana, there are seven and they are appointed by different elected governing bodies. So I have some library trustees who are appointed by our county council. I have some who are appointed by our county commission, and I have some that are appointed by our various public school districts. And they serve four-year terms. Oh, the public school districts. Yes. Oh, yes. that's authority for our library board. Oh, that's interesting. Now, then that's mandated. You have to have that particular setup. Is that Indiana or just Fort Wayne or? Indiana state law, yes. Okay, okay. Hmm. Uh, Claire, what about you? I, you've, I've, I've talked to you a little bit um, when I was talking to you about this program, you said you had to talk to your CEO and that fascinates me because we, <laughs> I'm used to director. So explain yeah. a little bit about your management structure. Um, so we also have a board. Uh, currently, there are nine members on our board, which includes one city councillor, and then everyone else applies to be on the board through the city. So like we're city adjacent, but we're not part of the city. And then they're chosen through their applications uh, to whether or not they are on the board. So then the board advises our policies and our plan of service. And then we have a CEO. We had a director up until about Ooh, maybe like seven years ago. And then they switched over to uh, having a CEO. And um, then, so then we have our management team and then we have what our level fours, which is what I am. So the coordinators of whatever. And then we have um, all of our library staff. So what was the difference between the CEO and the director? Was it just a title change or did they actually have different responsibilities? It seems like just a title change. Um, okay because I've been at the library for 14 years and what the director was um, sort of responsible for is the same as our CEO is now. I think they just felt that it maybe made more sense with the other titles in our structure that CEO made more sense. Okay, okay. Uh, Tammy, what about you? So um, most Kentucky libraries are set up the same way. There are some that are not, for example, Louisville, Lexington. Um, are a little different, but I report to a board of trustees. We have five members. Um, the current way those five members are chosen is um, that they are chosen by the board that sits now. We'll pick two people to submit to the Kentucky Department of Library and Archives. Those 
um, Kentucky Department of Library and Archives then like approves those two names and sends them on to our county judge executive, which is a position that only exists in the state of Kentucky. Um, and then our county judge executive from those two names will take one to a physical court meeting and have that person voted on um, whether or not to uh, join the library board. Um, so there's five of them and they're responsible for um, the hiring and firing of the uh, director approval of budgets and um, approving policies is basically their scope of duty. And one thing that's probably important to mention in Kentucky, at least, these are voluntary positions. They cannot be paid. They cannot receive really anything in exchange for their service, which is different than something like a water board or some of the other boards that exist in the state of Kentucky, where they do get compensation or insurance through the state or something like that for serving on that board. That is not the case in Kentucky. Our board members are all just volunteers, um, you know, community servants. So um, that's who I report to. And then below me, I have branch managers at each of my branches um, that are responsible for that individual branch. And um, then a facilities manager, of course, that makes sure the buildings don't fall around, around us because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay. Now, Justin, I know at McCracken, we'll have the same board director set up that Tammy mentioned, being in Kentucky, but you came to us from a library uh, in Pasadena, Texas. Do you know anything about the structure there that you can share? I'm really looking for, and the reason I'm asking this at each of the locations, I'm really looking for both differences and similarities between the two, um, because you think that a library in Kentucky would be vastly different from the library in Indiana or in California or in Texas, et cetera. But a seat, at least from what Susan had told me, what Tammy told me, a lot of that's the same. And it's the same as what Claire has in Canada in a lot of ways. So can you um, talk to me a little bit about the Texas Center? Sure. Um, th there was quite a lot of changes with coming here from Houston. Um, so the city of Pasadena, it's South Houston. It's about 160,000 people population. Uh, it had two branches and same kind of management team under the director, uh, but the director reported to city council um, as the city, as it was a city library, they reported to a city council and a mayor. Um, they did not have a board uh, the same way that Kentucky has. Um, whereas Kentucky has more of a governing board that actually decides policy um, actually decides the hiring and firing of the director. Um, theirs was much more of a advisory board, you know, things, recommendations that they could make. Uh, for example, if Tammy's board wanted new carpet, their board would meet and decide, we want new carpet. We're going to start shopping around for vendors. Uh, we're, this is our budget for carpet, and they would make it happen. An advisory board would recommend to city council and the mayor, we think that this new carpet should be put in. This is our recommendation for vendors for what kind of carpet we think should be put in. Um, but city council and mayor do not have to do what they want. Um, they take it into consideration, but it is ultimately up to a city council and the mayor to decide what happens with the budget, what happens with policy. So do you feel like you have more input in Kentucky than you would in Texas as far as library policy, budget, all those things? Um, I think there's much more, there's much more expediency and much more freedom in Kentucky. Um, for example, if I were the Pasadena library director and I wanted to make something happen, like I wanted to roll out um, self-check or if I wanted to get the parking lot redone, I would need to go to city council. I would need to put that in my budget. I would need for them to read the budget at least twice to approve it. And then they go through their vendors. They have the city attorney look it over. And basically, if I wanted something done, it would take a very long time. A lot of red tape as it goes through the, the city attorney, the city council, um, the advisory board and their thoughts on it. Whereas here, if I want to repave the parking lot, I could tell the board here at McCracken County, 
our parking lot needs repaving. There's a lot of potholes here. Uh, here's how much I think it should cost. And then they decide, okay, yeah, we don't like potholes either. Let's do something about that. And then they vote on it, decide on how much needs to be spent for it. And then we shop around for our vendors or request for proposal, depending on how much it would cost. And it, it's, it's much more efficient. It is much less red tape and things get done a lot faster. What's your experience in Indiana, Susan, as far as policy changes and those kinds of things in your input level? I have a similar trajectory as Justin in that prior to moving to Kentucky, I worked as a library administrator for the county of Los Angeles. And I was an employee of the county of Los Angeles. So everything was done through the county and the county of Los Angeles is bigger than, you know, most states in the United States. So, you know, talk about a certain amount of red tape, but everything was done through the county and there wasn't as much local control. Here in Indiana, similar to my experience at McCracken County, I have a governing board. Um, we say we're the Allen County Public Library and we serve all of the county, but we are not technically a county department similar to what Tammy and Justin have in their counties. So my board sets the policy, sets the budget. If we need to repave a parking lot, that is something that we do locally and our board decides upon. So very similar to what Justin described as it goes on in McCracken County. Okay, okay. But I, I'm, I'm in the, uh, that Texas and California and probably other libraries as well, report to the city government as opposed to a board that is technically appointed, that is appointed by the government, but not running it kind of fa fascinates me a little bit. Claire, what is your experience as far as that goes? And, and I, and I, yeah, I believe this is something you can answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So in Alberta, like we have a government ministry called the Public Library Services Branch. So every library oh. Yeah, every library reports their stats to this ministry. The ministry sets like minimum amounts for funding from the municipalities that they have to meet. And they're quite minimum. Um, so like there's sort of an overall reaching like ruled if you will. Um, but then it like it's our board and our CEO making the decisions in terms of like, can we figure out grant or funding for a new you know, HVAC system or a new branch or a new whatever. Um, so it's city adjacent, meaning like, like we are literally our main branches besides city hall, but we don't um, uh, like answer to city council or to the mayor. Um, they are very like nice to the library and they've been very supportive over the years that I've been at the library, but they don't have a say um, in final, um, you know, hiring or firing or if, you know, something is happening. Um, that's really on our CEO and board to figure out how they might pay for things. And oftentimes like the city, like that can be written into some of the budgets and stuff, but like for capital expenses, but generally speaking, it they are sort of at an arm's length. Okay, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about budgets. Um, actually, let's talk a lot about budgets. Um, years ago, when I first started at McCracken, I made a comment to um, our technical guy, Jay. I said something to him about my tax dollars paying his salaries. I was giving him grief. And uh, he said, you want to see what your tax dollars do? And he flipped the lights on and off and said, that's your tax dollars right there. And he was probably exaggerating, but it got me thinking. I don't know if a lot of people know exactly what the taxes they pay for libraries, what all that supports. Um, some people may think that their tax dollars go directly into my pockets. Some people may think that their tax dollars just allow, just buy materials. Um, so that when they request a book, they're a little put out that their book isn't ordered. So like, well, I pay my taxes. Why don't I have this book that I want? That kind of thing. Um, so I want, I'm going to call on each of you. I kind of want to know you to give an example, a talk about what, not in money per se, I don't need to know what your budget is, but how it's set and then what everything that that budget has to cover for your library to, um, to function. 
And let's start with Justin this time. Okay. We're right in um, budget season. At the we, we, it is budget season. Um, we determine our budget based upon projected ideas and what we need. Um, for example, if we think that the software we're paying, let's say we're paying $10,000 for it this year, uh, we need to budget and prepare for the idea that, like any company, prices are probably going to go up. So we can guesstimate, okay, we'll guess there'll probably be 12,000 this year, and we'll need to make room in the budget to prepare for that. Uh, some of the things that we can do can be technology, whether it is the, the catalog and the uh, online software that we use, it could be uh, maintaining the bookmobile, uh, making sure that the insurance is paid on that, that it's getting all the oil changes and everything it needs to do, getting new tires. Um, it could be just general day-to-day -day operation stuff, whether it is envelopes, postage, um, making sure that the janitors are, are cleaning, um, any, any number of things like that. And all of those you have to figure out how much am I paying for it now? How much am I going to pay for it next year? And is there anything that we need to change? Do we need to change janitorial companies? Do we need to change office supply vendors? Um, what can we do to examine how much we're paying now? And what can we do to save money for taxpayers? And what can we unfortunately not avoid? Um, sometimes we're, sometimes we, do, we, we have to buy stuff, but we try to make sure that we are spending our tax dollars responsibly. Absolutely. Uh, Tammy, what about you? I know, I think it would be probably similar to McCracken, correct? Right, yeah. So McCracken, like Marshall, will probably get the majority of its funding from real estate tax. Um, and so I think in Marshall County, that average that the person pays in is somewhere around $30. So basically you check out two James Patterson books and your return on investment is taken care of um, there. Um, but yeah, people kind of think, you know, when you think library, you think, okay, why do I need to pay though $30 for books when you've already got all these books? But for example, in Marshall County, I have three buildings I have to maintain. Um, I have nearly 40 employees that we pay, you know, their salary and, um, pay into Kentucky retirement, which is a big deal. And, you know, there are just so many expenses involved in keeping up a building. You know, you've got all these utilities and stuff. Um, every time it snows and ice, you've got to get that removed from your parking lot. That is not cheap. <laughs> um, and that's not something the county does for you. No. Like they do the courthouse, for example. No, no, because we are not part of that county government. So we have to obtain our own contracts. And um, as we said, everything's getting higher and higher. We have to keep um, our grounds taken care of. You know, I mean, I start hearing it as soon as our grass gets more than like this high. When somebody going to come mow, you know, that's not a small expense when you're you're talking about um a big place like this and especially when certain criteria have to be met in terms of you know who's mowing your yard has to have certain insurance policies and et cetera et cetera et cetera this isn't the same as you hiring little bobby next door to come and mow your yard um so there are lots of expenses that go into running a public library that probably people don't really put together because all they think of is those books on the shelf yeah yeah um, Susan, how about things in Indiana? Indiana is a different animal in that our fiscal year is the calendar year. Ooh. So in Kentucky, we would be in budget season right now, but not so much in Indiana. We really don't heat up on that until the fall. My budget is about $31 million a year, and that is primarily funded through local property taxes. We also get a small amount of something called local income tax. And fun fact, when I was first looking at financial reports, I kept seeing the acronym LIT. I'm like, what's LIT? That sounds cool, what's LIT? LIT is local income taxes. <laughs> there Not you go. quite as LIT as you hoped. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So with that kind of budget, we have a full-time chief financial officer. He's been with the library for over 20 years. There is a full finance team 
I am an experienced librarian. I am not an MBA government accountant. So that is well outside of my wheelhouse. I can budget, but when you're talking a budget of that amount, you need a CFO. So um, he is excellent. He has all the certifications on government financing. And we actually just won for, I believe, the 29th year in a row, a um, certificate of excellence in government financial accounting for how wonderful our records are. So I'm really proud of our finance team. And the two big misconceptions that I hear, and the funny thing is I've heard them when I worked in small libraries mm -hmm. and I hear them when I work in large libraries. People think that all the workers are volunteers. I literally had someone here in Fort Wayne, a reporter asked me a few months ago, oh, so do you work here? Does everybody a volunteer? We love volunteers, but our buildings would not stay open without the paid employees. And I think pretty much every public library in the country, if not the world, their single biggest expense is their personnel budget, as it should be. Um, the most valuable resource of the library goes home every night, right? It's the people. So that's gonna be our major expense. Um, another misconception, people think that all the books are donated that the publishers are just super generous and they just, just extras. You ever hear that? No, we buy those books too. Now, granted, you know, we buy in scale, so we'll get a discount from our major book vendors, but those all have to be purchased. And last year, I pulled the stats in preparation for our talk tonight, Kristen, and um, last year we spent a little over $4 million on collections. So that is 13 and a half percent of our overall operating expenditures went to collections. Now, does that include, is that digital and? Yes. Okay, that's everything. That's everything. Does that include your subscriptions? Like we had, like, at, you know, Midlab, we had um, Freegal, Hoopla, those, yeah. maybe. Okay. That includes all of that. Freegal, Hoopla, the database, okay. things like that. Okay. Okay. Claire, what about you? What 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 do you have for us? I think it's. And I know this similar. is not quite your wheelhouse. I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very similar. Um, I think that people don't necessarily think about more than just like the print books on the shelf as being the expense. Um, we have uh, like we're a union staff primarily, so we all are paid very nicely and uh, we they put in you know for our retirement funds and all of that stuff so like there is expense definitely in personnel and I think a lot of yeah a lot of people do think that we are volunteers or some of us are volunteers and some of us are staff but we have very specific rules about volunteer positions because we are a union environment in terms of what can be a volunteer position and what cannot be um, so yeah, I think definitely it's the staffing first and everything is expensive, like everything, <laughs> like you get Libby or you do whatever, but then it's filling Libby and it's, you know, everyone is always questioning, why do you only have one copy of this digital book? It's because that digital book costs, you know, X amount of dollars or that audio book costs X amount of dollars. It's not just an open file for everyone to use, which is a little bit sad, but it's hard to explain the level of cost and some of these things. Um, especially to a community like we're a smaller community and you know you want to do as much as you can but sometimes it's just it is what it is <laughs> yeah um because I mean I, and I think Tammy and I talked about this before just how much publishers are charging for those digital items is in my opinion ridiculous um just because and it's not only per item, but sometimes it's for how many times you can check Use it. your users can yeah. use it, those kinds of things as well. Um, something else when I know. moved into my position as the Young Adult Services Coordinator, I took over collections for the Young Adult Collection. So that's print and digital and everything. And I was one of those people being like, you know, we can just buy everything, we have dollars. And then you look at your budget and you look at how much things are and you're like, no, actually, we can't buy everything. We have to really decide what series are we going to carry? What audiobooks, like in e-audiobooks, are we going to carry? So it was a huge eye-opening experience for me. Now, um, 
do you have, I know Marshall does, I know McCracken does. Uh, Claire, do you have like a friends group at your yes. library? Okay. We do. We have a very supportive friends of the library group. We have um, a little like library book, like not library books, but like donated book store. And then we do a two year uh, or two time a year, like big sale, not over COVID, but they're starting up again in the summer. And they are always extremely, uh, you know, generous with what they fund and all of the little things that, you know, aren't there in the budget for. And all those little special things are, we have a book bike. Um, we got it the year, I think, of COVID. So that was kind of like obviously pre-planned and then COVID. And so all of those like little things with our pop-up branch, for example, like that wasn't necessarily, a, you know, three-year planned out um, expenditure. So friends really came through with those funds as well. So yeah, Friends of the Library is pretty excellent. Is your library fine free? Yes, we went fine free during COVID um, and we had just gone membership. Like um, yeah, uh, we had membership fees until about five years ago, I want to say. Um, so it was $10 a year if you lived in the city, but now it's it's been free as well. So Okay. And I know Marshall went fine free right after COVID. McCracken went fine free during COVID, right, Susan? It was April 2020. It was supposed to be when McCracken was celebrating its 50th anniversary of the building. Remember all that? I do. We did not get <laughs> yes. to do it. Yes, Justin can probably find some of the stickers and buttons in that office. Oh, I I have so many 50 at 555 <laughs> stickers and buttons. I, I, I can't give enough away. They're fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have big plans. We have big plans. Darn COVID. Uh, now, does Allen County have a friends the same way? We, have a we do. We have a friends group and we have a foundation as well. Oh, okay. Okay. And all of that, any kind of... Um, Books that can you really budget for what you anticipate receiving in a book sale from a friend's book sale? Is that something that you can put in as a line item? I really don't know. Any we typically it. don't. Okay. What about Marshall or McCracken? We don't actually have a friend's group. We're friendless. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no friends here. <laughs> I, I, I feel like them. someone's in need of a hug. This is horrible. <laughs> uh, McCracken County does have a friends group and is incredibly successful. Um, I about fell out of my chair after the first book sale. It was phenomenal. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Tammy, do you know if your library has ever had a friends group or is that like a late development? No, we have never had a friends group. Oh my. Mm -mm. I was not expecting to hear that. I'm very surprised. I Honestly, I just assumed it was something Kentucky libraries just did. I, we're all learning things tonight. Um, <laughs> The other thing I want to ask before we switch to um, the second portion of the programming, as far as I know that Kentucky has like um, a library association, and you also mentioned the um, department, something department where you submit your board members to. You tell me what that is again, Tammy. I know those like oh, 10 minutes ago. But it's <laughs> department for Library and Archives. And is that a government department? It is. It okay. is. That is part of the Kentucky State government. And they kind of act in an advisory role. Um, but also, like, we, for example, um, Justin and I, because of our positions and because of how many people we serve, and we have to have a certain level of certification. And everybody who works under us full time has to have a certain level of certification based on their role. And so they're responsible for making sure we reach those levels of certification, granting those levels of certification. 
Um, and is that Kentucky law? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, what about in Indiana? Do you have like an association of libraries there? Um, do you have like a government department that's over statewide over your libraries? We do. We have the Indiana State Library, and there is also a professional certification program for all public facing library staff in Indiana. So we have similar certification requirements for a certain amount of continuing education hours. Okay. Justin, do they have that in Texas? Do they have like that association or anything? They they have a Texas Library Association, but it does not operate the same way. Um, like like Tammy mentioned, uh, KDLA, uh, they require a certain amount of certification hours. That they, they, there's certain things that they require. Texas does not require any of that. No no certifications, no ongoing hours, but also no level of support. So if we're filing for a grant or E-rate or something to you know supplement our library budget, uh, Kentucky has KDLA, those advisory staff that we can go to to help us file for assistance. In, Kentucky, in Texas, if you needed to file for that, you're on your own. Like you, you would hire an outside consultant to help you with that. Um, but there's no, there's no support team like KDLA in Texas. Um, you're, it's, it's very much on your own out there. It's very wild west. But <laughs> on the flip side, no certifications. Um, but when I first came here and they told me, oh, well, you got to get your certificate. I thought, I already got the library degree. Like I got the student debt to prove it and everything. Like is the certificate <laughs> really necessary? Um, yeah, but I, I appreciate it though. It definitely keeps staff engaged and engaging. Susan, um, what about out in LA County? Is was that did they have certifications in the state association? California did not, and I almost think California is just too unwieldy to have a state program like that. The first time I ever had any kind of state certification requirements was when I worked in Kentucky. And it may just be because of the size of our state as well. We're small enough that we can kind of exert that control of our public libraries and they'll fall in line. <laughs> I guess. And, and I also think, and I'm just speculating here, but both Kentucky and Indiana have a significant rural population, very small communities where you may not have many candidates with a formal library background. So it's a way for those directors to get the train and support they need. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so what about, what do you have? Do you have like, is there like a Canadian government associate? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no know what I want to ask, but maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> There's no um, like certification process. So like if you have your master's of library information sciences and you're a librarian, you're a librarian. You don't have to get some sort of Alberta certification. Or if you move to BC, you don't have to, sorry, British Columbia for our American friends watching. Um, so it's an adjacent province to us. Uh, you don't have like a different certification for that province either. So it's it's not similar. Okay, okay. Um, what's fascinating me about this uh, discussion is there's a lot of both similarities and then there's a few differences, but there's way more similar um, than I would have thought considering how widespread um, our, our representatives are, um, and we're, and similar to, to our neighbors to the North as well. Um, but I want to thank you guys so much tonight for taking the time to talk to me, um, for agreeing to this program that I just dreamed up out of my head and forced people to do with me. <laughs> I appreciate it <laughs> so very much. Um, and to those of you out there watching, thank you so much for, uh, spending time with us tonight. I hope that you learn a little bit about libraries. I hope that you feel uh, more in love with your library than you already were. And um, I hope you all have a good evening.